This video is brought to you by LogRocket, the front-end performance monitor that records videos of user sessions along with logs and network data, surfacing problems and revealing the root cause of every bug. Try it today at LogRocket.com YT. In this video, we'll be going over some of the most useful and exciting JavaScript features that are being added as part of the ES2020 standard. The first feature we'll go over is BigInt which you won't use this a ton, but this might save you some time debugging if you do happen to run into an issue where you're adding really, really large numbers. Or this could be used in a programming interview, kind of a trivia thing. But basically what we'll do is we will go ahead and declare a new variable, which is going to be this max safe integer. And this is gonna be a type number, and this is going to be the largest possible integer that you can use safely in JavaScript. And now that we've declared that, let's log it out. So we have this nine quadrillion number. And let's go ahead and add one to it just to see what happens here. So it does increment successfully, so there's no issue here. The thing is, there can be some inconsistencies across different environments. Right now we're using Firefox. Let's open up a terminal and see how this behaves in Node. So we'll go ahead and declare the same myNum as number.maxSafe integer. And let's log that out to make sure we get the same thing. And then we'll go ahead and increment it. And we can see here that we don't get the same behavior. So this actually doesn't go past that MaxSafe integer. So you can see there are inconsistencies across different environments. And this is exactly what BigInt aims to do. So it's providing a new type. And we'll double check here and make sure that the type of our myNum is going to be number. And now let's see how big int is going to behave. So there are two different ways to declare a big int. Let's declare my big int. And the first way that we'll declare a big int is using the keyword big int. And let's show the second way here, which is to include an N at the end of the number. Now we'll make sure we'll give it a separate name. So we give it a unique name here for our variable and that'll work just fine. And now that we've declared our big ints, let's go ahead and add that max safe integer and we can see what the behavior is here. So there's an error because we are trying to add numbers of different types. So that's something to watch out for. What we'll do instead here is we will cast this max safe integer to a big int using the keyword that I mentioned before. And once we do that, we can see that we do get the proper addition that we're expecting. And just like we did above where we have an n at the end of the number, this console is going to return a number that has an n at the end of it, and that's going to signify that we have a big int. So let's go ahead and do the same thing for my big int too and we can see that it's properly adding again. So this kind of notation is going to be acceptable across all different runtimes. This is gonna be a consistent behavior in Node, in Firefox, and in all different browsers that support BigInt. And as soon as this feature is supported in all major browsers, then this is going to be something that you can rely on when you need to add or deal with really huge numbers. So that's BigInt. Now let's take a look at nullish coalescing, which will give us a little bit better control over how we're accessing values from an object. So let's first go ahead and declare my object. And we'll add a couple of keys and values in here. Now if we're gonna create a new variable and assign that variable to a property within this object, Sometimes we want to do that conditionally. So we might do prop1.childprop or this new string. Now the issue with this notation is that in this case, we have an empty string for child prop, and that's actually going to evaluate to a falsy value. So if we go ahead and cast this to a Boolean, then we can see that this is going to be false. And the problem this presents is that when we are assigning a value using this or syntax, then the first value here is going to evaluate to false, and it's going to end up overwriting this already set value to 
the default or the backup that we're giving it. So even though I've already assigned child prop a value of this empty string, it's now going to reassign it to this something new. And sometimes this isn't the behavior that you want. In fact, uh, a lot of times you would prefer to keep the empty string. And so with nullish coalescing, this is going to give us a different syntax in order for us to be able to basically keep this empty string and uh, not, not have this evaluate to a falsy value. So let's go ahead and clear out our terminal. So let's start by declaring this object, and this is going to have a bunch of different properties in here with several different values, some, evaluate, some evaluating to uh, falsy values and, and some being truthy. So we've got one with null, one with a number, one with zero, an empty string, and false. Now, if we use this null value, of course, this is going to be falsy. And if we use an or statement here, it's going to evaluate to this string that I give it. And we can see that that's null. And if we do the same thing, assigning a new variable, then we'll see similar behavior where it's evaluating to this backup string that we give it. So now let's do the same thing for animation duration, which has a zero. And the zero will also evaluate to falsy. So it's going to end up giving us this second value again, which is 400, even though we've already set this animation duration. And again, this might not be really desired behavior because we have this zero in here that's set. And instead, it's assigning this 400. And let's try this again with header text. So this header text, again, has been set to an empty string. And we'll give it this default header text as a backup. And when we log this out here, we're going to see that it's defaulted to this default header text, which really isn't what we want because it's already been set with this empty string before. And let's try this one last time with show response, which has a value of fault set to it. And when we check with the or statement and assign it to an, an or value of true, then now it's going to once again fall back onto this default value which we've given it, which is true, even though we've already set it as false. Now let's take a look at the ES2020 feature that enables us to basically use these values that we've already set. So let's take another look at settings. We can see the animation duration, the header text, the height, the null value, and the show response here. And now we'll assign this new animation duration, and we'll use these double question marks basically to say that if this is set to something that's not null or undefined, then we're going to keep that value. Otherwise, we're going to use this fallback value. So now when we check out our new animation duration, we log this. Since it's already set as a zero, which is not null or undefined, then it's going to take that zero rather than the fallback. And I'll do the same thing for empty strings. So let's try this out with header text. And since we're using nullish coalescing, it's going to keep this empty string as the value there. And lastly, we'll try it with this false value for show response. And you, using the double quote question mark syntax, it'll keep it as that false value. Since it is assigned a value, it's not null or undefined. So it's going to keep that value, whether it's a false whether it's a zero or an empty string. So this can really be helpful in cases where you've set properties on an object and you still want to use a fallback value if they are not set or if they are null or undefined. Um, nullish coalescing will give you an opportunity to basically apply fallback values only if you really need the fallback value. Now let's take a look at a feature called optional chaining. And this is going to allow us to access properties on an object that are deeply nested without having to do a lot of fallbacks. So let's go ahead and declare an object that's going to have some deep nesting on it. And if I try to assign a variable to a non-existent key within that object, I'm going to get an error. 
And this error happens because one of the keys before the final key that I'm checking does not exist. So this bad key is not even in the object at all. Now, typically in order to avoid this, I would have to use lots of and statements, which we'll take a look at in a sec. But let's see how to avoid this with optional chaining. So it's a very simple syntax. We just add question marks in front of all of them. Um, and this makes it so if there is not a key that exists for that key that I'm trying to access, then it's not going to give me uh, an undefined error. And you can see here that it, when I assign this value, it's just going to give me undefined. And that is A-OK -okay with me. This would be the other way that we would handle it, which is we'd do mysterious object and mysterious object dot bad key and so on and so forth. And you can see this kind of just gets unruly. And so with optional chaining, we end up saving a lot of space and a lot of typing. And it gives us uh, just a little better syntax for accessing deeply nested keys within an object. The next feature we'll look at is promise.allsettled, which basically allows us to wait for a certain array of promises to return or to settle, resolve, or reject before we go ahead and perform any actions. So we'll start off by declaring promise one and just set a timeout here. We'll set a 30 second timeout. And then we'll go ahead and declare promise two with a similar situation here. We'll give it resolve and reject and we'll set a timeout and we'll resolve after 40 seconds. So 40,000 milliseconds. And then once we have these two promises, then we'll go ahead and use all settled here. So we'll do promise dot all settled and we'll pass in promise one and promise two to this all settled function here. And then we will take the results of all of those promises. And in this case, we'll just iterate over them for each and for each of those results we'll go ahead and log out that result and we'll see that this will wait until everything is settled so both of those promises are either resolved or rejected and once both of those are settled then we can see that both of them have the status of fulfilled because i resolved both of them and then we can move forward from there but that didn't execute until both of those promises were settled both of them either resolved or rejected. And this can be really helpful for any time you really want to wait until a lot of asynchronous code is executing and once it's finished executing. So you don't have to um, continue running code once the first one settles or the second one settles or once one resolves or one rejects. You can wait for everything to happen and then continue on with whatever code you want to run. And the final ES2020 feature that we're going to take a look at is global this. Now, global this is helpful because there are several different uh, this variables that you can use, especially depending on the environment. So if we start out in the browser, and if we're in a global context, we can just use this, and we'll see that it'll return the window object. We can also use window. It'll return that same window object. Let's go ahead and set a variable on the window object just so we can see how that's going to behave. So we'll see first it's undefined, and then we set a value on that, and we can see it's some var. Now if we check out window again, we can see where we have a variable down here, and we can see that it has the value that we gave it, some var. And let's access that same window object with a different keyword now, which is self. So in this case, self is going to evaluate to the same thing. And we can see that it has a variable on it. Another keyword that you can use is frames. And we can see that it has a variable as well. Now, depending on the context that you're in, uh, if you're in a web worker or if you're within a function, sometimes each of these will return different things. And so, um, what can be helpful is to always have access to this window object or this uh, global this object. And that's where global this comes in. Now global this is especially useful because when we're 
moving back and forth between different environments, namely Node, where Node will see different this and self and, and uh, different global this objects. Um, we want to be able to use something across those different environments. So now if we go ahead and jump into a Node environment, and we're using Node version 12, and we use this, we can see all the different variables and functions on this as we're in a global context. So let's go ahead and assign that same variable onto this. We'll give it some var here. And now let's check global this. And we can see a variable there. We'll just return that. And we can see that that's the same. So global this gives you the opportunity to have a global this variable where you can access uh, this global context, no matter if you're in a function, if you're in the browser, if you're in Node, no matter where you are, it gives you this consistency across all these different environments. So global this can be very helpful because it gives you really this consistent behavior, no matter what context you're in. So those are some of the ES2020 features to look out for this year. Thanks for watching. And if you like this video, go ahead and subscribe to the channel for more videos like it.